So the first thing we should do in this uh, unit on organic chemistry is to differentiate between uh, inorganic chemistry and uh, inorganic compounds versus organic chemistry and organic compounds. Now historically uh, what uh, the division was was that inorganic compounds uh, came from non-living things and, and were produced from non-living processes whereas organic compounds were uh, compounds and molecules produced from living things from life. Now that um, process uh, that the historical definition um, breaks down with a lot of different types of molecules because it turns out inorganic molecules can be produced from organic uh, or from living things and uh, organic molecules can uh, be uh, produced from non-living processes. So uh, currently the uh, difference between these uh, two is all boils down to carbon and hydrogen. All right, organic compounds and organic chemistry uh, deal with uh, carbon containing molecules. Carbon containing molecules. Uh, these carbon atoms, uh, actually I should say carbon and hydrogen containing molecules. Uh, so any molecule with just uh, carbon and hydrogen, of course, um, are called hydrocarbons. Um, so that will be the, uh, the focus of our introduction into organic chemistry. But additionally, organic compounds can contain uh, small amounts of other elements. And the most important elements um, that we will discuss in this course can contain uh, other elements such as oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, um, halogens like chlorine, um, and so forth. And there's a few more, but uh, we'll focus primarily on oxygen, nitrogen, a little bit on sulfur. And then basically inorganic uh, chemistry is pretty much everything else. Uh, the uh, inorganic chemistry studies metals, such as you know, gold or copper um, or silver, ionic compounds, such as uh, sodium chloride or uh, magnesium, hydroxide, and then of course uh, molecules that do not contain primarily hydrocarbons. Molecules that are not primarily hydrocarbons. Okay, so one good example would be one that even does have carbon, but is CO2, carbon dioxide, largely be considered an inorganic compound because it doesn't have hydrogen. Um, NO2 would be another example. Um, how about um, HNO3, an acid. So really, uh, the key to organic compounds is it's mainly the chemistry of carbon and how it reacts with hydrogen and then uh, a few other elements. So to start off, we'll uh, initially just talk about molecules that contain just carbon and just hydrogen. And if those compounds contain only single bonds, they are known as alkanes. So alkanes are hydrocarbons with all single bonds. And so a couple things to remember when we're starting to talk about organic compounds that will be really important for us to remember is that carbon is always going to have four bonds. So 
So uh, stable organic molecules always contain carbon, having four bonds. And of course, the first, um, the simplest organic molecule is methane, CH4, which has carbon, has four single bonds between the hydrogen atoms, and it takes on a tetrahedral shape, which we've seen before. So carbon bonded to four hydrogen atoms is CH4. That's the simplest uh, organic compound because it only contains one carbon. And of course, we can expand to larger organic molecules such as C2H6, uh, which is two carbons bonded to each other. And each carbon needs three additional hydrogen atoms bonded to itself to get to four bonds. And of course, it needs four bonds uh, to satisfy the octet rule and um, make it stable. And so we can keep on building um, carbon atoms uh, one at a time, or building these molecules one carbon atom at a time. Um, we could have a molecule with three carbons. So we have three carbons bonded to each other. And of course, uh, we know that each carbon atom has to have four bonds. And so the carbon atoms in the middle are going to need to bond to two hydrogens. The carbon atoms on the end, or the terminal carbons, need to bond to three hydrogens. And so it turns out if we know how many carbons are in a hydrocarbon, and if it's an alkane, we can always figure out how many hydrogens are bonded to it. So this, is, this compound is C3H68. All right, so as you can imagine, uh, these can keep on going, and they can get very large very quickly. Go to 3, 4, 5, 10, 20 uh, carbon atoms bonded together. And so it turns out we are going to want to develop a couple of different ways to uh, talk about large organic molecules um, a little bit more uh, simply and conveniently. And so what we will do is we will talk about condensed formulas and skeletal formulas. All right. And so if we wanted to show a molecule, uh, organic molecule, that has four carbons bonded to each other, and so we've got... Uh, two carbons in the middle that will each bond to two hydrogens. And the uh, two uh, carbons on the end will each bond to three hydrogen atoms to get to four bonds. And to show this um, a little bit more uh, conveniently, we can use a condensed formula. Overall, this is C4H6810, but it turns out the molecular formula is often um, not useful because it doesn't give us information about how the carbon atoms are put together or its structural formula. And so what we can do is we can group terminal uh, carbons that are each bonded uh, to three hydrogens as a CH3 group. So it would be the same thing over here. And then each carbon in the middle that's bonded to a uh, two hydrogens, we can group as a CH2 group. And so we can write this as CH3, CH2, CH2, CH3. So that's known as a condensed formula. And we can even condense it a little bit further by grouping these uh, same CH2 groups together and using a subscript. So we can turn this into CH3, CH2, and just like we did for polyatomic ions and inorganic compounds, put a parenthesis around them and say that there's two of them in the middle. And then CH3. Now, different from ionic compounds is that we can still go backwards and go all the way back to the structural formula and see how these carbon atoms are connected um, to hydrogens by just expanding the condensed formula. Now, as you can imagine, this is really useful for really long uh, hydrocarbons. So if we were to talk about something with, say, 10 hydrocarbons, so we could say CH3, CH2, 
2, and then CH3. And if it's 10 carbon atoms, we know that there's 8 in the middle, and then 2 on the end. And so instead of writing 10 carbons all straight across with all the hydrogens connected to it, we can write the condensed formula for um, C10, H16, 19, 22. Okay, and there's still another way we want to um, be able to um, write these a little bit more quickly and conveniently, and that is to um, draw skeletal formulas. Okay, so as you uh, remember, carbon bonded to four bonds, or bonded to four atoms with four bonds, takes on a tetrahedral uh, shape. Okay, and so if we were to uh, take one of these hydrogens off and bond it to another carbon, it would take on uh, this shape. Um, the next hydrocarbon uh, would come down at a, a tetrahedral geometry as well. And so what we would need to do is take off another uh, hydrogen atom and bond it to another carbon. And you can see that it sort of takes on this bent shape. Now what keeps on happening is that any additional carbon will be added to the hydrocarbon in sort of a seesaw fashion. So let's take off another carbon and add it here. So here's the uh, three-dimensional structure of this four carbon hydrocarbon. And as you can sort of see, it takes on a very um, specific geometric shape or geometric pattern where it goes up and down, up and down. And we can keep on adding uh, carbon. So let's go to uh, five and six hydrocarbons. And so we'll take this hydrogen off and add on two more. So now we've got six hydrocarbons. And so Again, it takes on this very characteristic seesaw shape. And so that's what we can do to sort of um, draw organic molecules and hydrocarbons in a very quick uh, manner. And so we're going to draw carbons in this geometry up and down to uh, represent the tetrahedral uh, structure. And in doing so, what we're also going to do is stop writing the symbols for carbon and hydrogen. And so what happens is for every carbon, we're going to either start a line or draw an inflection point, All right? So let's go back to just our four carbon hydrocarbon. All right, so we've got uh, this four carbon hydrocarbon. Um, and so right here, I'm gonna start this line with one um, line going up to represent this carbon to this carbon bottom. So anytime you start a line or there's an inflection point, that's going to be a carbon. And so I'll come down to that carbon and then up to the last carbon. And so here I'm drawing the skeletal formula for this four carbon hydrocarbon. Now that's all I need to write. Every inflection point uh, or start or end of a line I know is a carbon. So in this skeletal formula, I know there's one, two, three carbons, and three, four carbons, excuse me. So I can say that this is C4. And I don't even need to write out how many hydrogens um, there are in this molecule, because I know that carbon always has to have four bonds. So this carbon on the end is only bonded to one other carbon. And so I know that it needs three additional bonds, so there must be three hydrogens bonded to that carbon to equal four bonds to make sure it's stable and has the octet rule. This carbon in the middle is bonded, this carbon right here is bonded to two carbons. So that's two bonds. And so I know it must be bonded to two other hydrogens. So I don't even need to write that. I can always figure it out. And then of course, same thing for this carbon. It's bonded to two carbons, one, two bonds. And so it must be bonded to two other hydrogen atoms. So there's two hydrogens here. And then this last carbon on the end must be bonded to three hydrogens because of course it's only, I can only see one carbon there 
and so that's one bond must have three other hydrogens and so by just by looking at this simple skeletal form a skeletal structure i can know that this is four carbons and then of course three two seven ten hydrogens all right so uh let's do it for another uh, compound let's go backwards let's try to figure out the formula for this alkane all right so here we've got a skeletal formula every single inflection point and start or end of a line is a carbon and so i know i have one two three four five six carbons so i know this formula is c6 and how many hydrogens are there again this the carbons on the end are only going to be bonded to one other carbon and so to get to four bonds they have three hydrogens that's going to be the same for both ends and every single carbon in the middle is bonded to two hydrogens or excuse me two carbons and so must be bonded to two hydrogen atoms and that will be the same story for every single uh, interior carbon atom. It has to be bonded to two hydrogens to be uh, stable with four bonds. So once I figure that out, I can just count them up. Three, five, seven, nine, eleven, fourteen hydrogens. So the formula for this hydrocarbon is C6H14. So we can see that we have the, the structural, the model here, and we can see that's the case. There's going to be six carbons, one, two, three, four, five, six. The end carbons are all bonded to three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three. And then each interior carbon atom is bonded to one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two hydrogens to get to form bonds. And of course it has that characteristic seesaw shape because of the tetrahedral geometry of each individual carbon. Um, another thing we can do is we can also write the uh, condensed formula for this. We can say CH3 on the end. And in here, there's one, two, three, four CH2s. And then finally, another CH3. So we can write the condensed formula for this hydrocarbon as well.